The last week we finished looking at archaeological discoveries during the period of the divided kingdom. So that's 931, 930 down to 722. And I wanted to give you a quick reminder, just a quick look at the discoveries that we looked at during that period of time. I'll go through them very quickly, but I added a little uh, explanation to help you remember what I thought was the, the tie to the Bible. But we started out looking in the divided kingdom. All right, so you see that confirms the raid mentioned there. I won't read all of those, but you can glance at them, and I'm just hoping. I want to just go through them quickly, so we'll get back to where we were. But we, we had the Shishak inscription, the ivory of Samaria. You had an example of that, which is relevant to uh, the place Ahab built, that ivory house. The stela of Shalmaneser III, Kirk stela. You can see that's quite significant. Uh, the Misha stela, or the Moabite stone, we looked at that. Uh, the Tel Dan stela, which I thought was really cool. Not only does it mention the house of David, but it confirms Hatzael's battle with the kings there. You have the, we started last week looking at the black obelisk of Shalmaneser, which mentions Jehu, son of Omri. The rim inscription that mentions Joash of Samaria. We have the various seals here as a, a belonging to Shema's servant of Jeroboam. Then we have the Isaiah seals that you have there. There's another Isaiah seal. There's the Isaiah inscription that we talked about. There's the annals of Tiglath-Pileser. Confirm the report that Menachem paid tribute. Then we have a building inscription of Tiglath-Pileser III, which the, confirms the report in 2 Kings 16 that Ahaz paid tribute. The relief celebrating that capture of Ashtaroth, which was part of a larger campaign, but with what is said in the annals, it confirms what's there in 1 Chronicles 5.26. Then we have Ahaz, son of Jotham, a seal of king of Judah. Another Ahaz seal. And if you just came in and you're wondering, is the guy going to be going this fast? <laughs> no, I'm just kind of racing through what we've already talked about just to remind people because I like to try to reinforce it. So you'll never remember it anyway, but something may, you might go, I think there are seals that actually talk about some of these kings. Okay, and I, I just see it, it's a neat connection. But here we have belonging to the Abbey Minister of Hoshea. And then we ended here with the, uh, uh, at the part of the divided kingdom with those human-headed winged bulls that are in front of Sargon's palace. So what I wanted to do, so we looked at the things between the, divide, the period of the divided kingdom. So, nine, so 931, 930 down to 722. And then we started looking at archaeological discoveries relating to the period when Judah was the sole kingdom. So after you have the divided kingdom and the Assyrians take away the northern kingdom of Israel, they conquer Samaria, 722, that leaves the southern kingdom of Judah. So I'm now looking at the period from 722 down until the time when the Babylonians take away Judah in 587. So 722 to 587 is the period we're focusing on. And we started looking at that last week, and we looked at the Taylor prism, which has the Assyrian king Sennacherib's account of his coming to Jerusalem in 701 B.C. This is when Hezekiah is the king. It's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19. And we're told there that Hezekiah, that he sent, he sent tribute to Sennacherib, and we're also told there that God miraculously protected the city of Jerusalem from the Assyrian forces. And the Taylor Prism, which is Sennacherib's account of that campaign in 701, it confirms that Hezekiah paid tribute to him. And then it indirectly confirms uh, the, the Bible's description of God's miraculous protection when it doesn't report that he conquered Jerusalem. So here he is on this campaign. I'm going there. I've got these cities. As we'll see, he's got, uh, he's got Lachish. And, and he comes here and he says, I, I had Hezekiah the Jew. I had him in Jerusalem sealed up like a bird in a cage. And? And? Nothing. You see, nothing. Well, that would fit. See, that he, would he report that he had to flee? No, he wouldn't report that. So I just see it's this indirect confirmation. All right, what I next want to look at, so now we're back up to where we were. I next want to look at uh, what are known as Lachish reliefs. Lachish reliefs. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 14. It indicates that Sennacherib had captured the fortified city of Lachish. And it indicates that because otherwise 
Hezekiah would not have sent word to Sennacherib in Lachish. So the fact he sends word to him there, that means Sennacherib is in Lachish. That means he's captured the city. And in the middle of the 19th century, a man named Austin Laird discovered stone reliefs from Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh depicting the conquest of Lachish during this 701 B.C. campaign. And these reliefs, they reveal details of siege techniques, like how did they actually you know, lay siege to a city. And also it shows some other military trappings. And they portray, not necessarily in the picture that I have here, but they portray some captives who are stripped naked and impaled on stakes. Others are departing the city in carts or on foot. And the fact that there was no relief in the palace depicting or relating to Jerusalem, the capital, that again confirms that there was nothing to brag about with regard to Jerusalem. If he had taken the capital city, you know that would have featured prominently, and there's nothing there. So I said, that's exactly what I would expect. I wouldn't expect him to come and say, by the way, I was bossing, and then what happened was I got thumped. No, he'd just say, look at all the stuff, the great stuff I did. And you go, well, what about Jerusalem? Shh, don't tell anybody about that. So that's how that works. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20. And 2 Chronicles 32, verses 3 and 4. And 32, verse 30. They reveal that Hezekiah, he prepared for this anticipated siege of Jerusalem by Sennacherib. He prepared by blocking up the outside water sources so they wouldn't be available to the Assyrians. I mean, that's smart military strategy. If you've got water outside, you don't want people, the military, to have access, easy access to water while they're laying siege to your city. You want to make things harder. So he blocks up access to the external or outside water sources, but he also creates a tunnel where he brings water from the outside into the city. And you can also look at Isaiah chapter 22, verses 9 through 11, where most people understand that to be referring to Hezekiah in his time, though there are a few who think, no, it's not really clear, I don't know if he's talking about. But most would agree that, no, Isaiah 22, 9 through 11 is speaking about Hezekiah's time. Second Chronicles 32, verse 30, it specifies that he directed waters from the Gihon Spring, he directed them from there to the west side of what is called the City of David, which is this little tongue portion of the larger city of Jerusalem. You see, this is the old city, the city of David, out here on the southeastern side on that hill. And so the scripture says that he dug a tunnel where he directed the water from the Gihon Spring over to the west side of the city of David. Now this tunnel was discovered in 1838 by an American scholar named Edward Robinson, and what do you know? It runs from the Gihon Spring, just outside of Hezekiah's eastern wall, to the Pool of Siloam. It runs in a southwestern direction to the Pool of Siloam, in the corner of the city of David, meaning that oldest area of the larger city. It's 1,750 feet, this, this tunnel, which is chiseled through rock, and it's deep down. And so they wound up and they dug this tunnel there, it's that large, and it has an average height of six feet. So here, way down underground, they've brought water in inside to the safer portions of the city, anticipating the siege of Sennacherib. And here we have this very tunnel. Then in 1880, 42 years after the discovery of the tunnel itself, an inscription of six lines of Hebrew Dating from the 8th century B.C., that inscription was discovered in the tunnel by some Arab boys who were in there. They find this inscription, and it's known as the Siloam inscription, and it, it explains how the tunnel was dug. And it says the tunneling, and this was how the tunneling was completed, as the stone cutters wielded their picks, each crew toward the other. So they started at different ends, and they dug toward each other. And people still marvel, how did they do that? How did they wind up there? It says, uh, each crew toward the other, and while there were still three cubits to go, the voices of the men calling each other could be heard, 
since there was an increase in sound on the right and left. The day the breach was made, the stonecutters hacked toward each other, pick against pick, and the water flowed from the source to the pool, 1,200 cubits, even though the height of the rock above the heads of the stonecutters was 100 cubits. And so here we have these guys digging this tunnel and doing that. Now, fortunately, there were several casts of this inscription that were made, and I say fortunately because that inscription was later chiseled from the wall in the dead of night. But the inscription was recovered, but it's broken and incomplete now. And there you see the recovered inscription. Now, Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 5, and Isaiah chapter 22, verses 9 and 10, with the little footnote that some people would object to Isaiah 22, 9 and 10, but as I say, most people recognize that that is indeed referring to Hezekiah's time, and it seems pretty clear to me that it is. But you have 2 Chronicles 32, 5 and Isaiah 22, 9 and 10 reveals that Hezekiah's preparations in anticipation of this assault by Sennacherib, it included building up breaks in the city wall and building an additional wall outside of it. Now this additional wall was built to enclose what's known as the second quarter. And you can see that phrase, the second quarter, in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. That's the area west of the walled city. It's a, this is the second quarter, this area west of the walled city that had become occupied during this population explosion following the, the collapse of Samaria decades earlier. Remember, the northern kingdom of Samaria is gone in 722 is when the Assyrians conquer it. Well, this is now 701. So we've had decades where the people there come and they're out in this portion of the city. And so this wall is probably enclosing that. And we have excavations that were begun in 1969 by Naman Avigad. And he discovers a section of a massive wall. Is this guy going to work? I say yes. This massive wall right here he discovers on a section of this wall that has been built around here in that, in that uh, second quarter. And it's dated by pottery, that wall, to the late 8th century. Okay, so right around the time we've got Sennacherib coming in 701, late 8th century, this wall is constructed. Scripture says he builds a wall. And we have this wall that's dated to that time, and it's called the Broad Wall because this lengthy section... Over 200 feet has been exposed, but this wall is 23 feet thick. And so they've exposed over 200 feet of it. And you can see how the constraints that you have of trying to do anything in and around Jerusalem. And by the way, there's no archaeology done on the Temple Mount itself. That's for political reasons. You cannot go, and there's been no excavations. Like Eilat, Eilat Mazar's stuff has been down in the city of David, down on that tongue that I showed you, down there, down, you know, doing some stuff there. And other stuff has been done around Jerusalem. But the temple, the temple mount itself, you don't go in there. There was somebody who went in there, excavated. I don't know if it was on the mount, but they illegally excavated. They were digging some stairs to go. They wanted a, a downstairs to a mosque. And they just brought in some kind of uh, you know, machinery to dig it out. And then they dumped the stuff. Well, these Israeli archaeologists then went and wet-sifted all of that stuff. And they found some interesting seals and that kind of thing. But basically, I just wanted you to know, the politics of the region, as you know, are, are crazy. And so if you think you can go over there and just say, we're going to go and, and we would like to go and do archaeological work on the Temple Mount, no. Because people are afraid what you find. If you find this supports that, we don't like that, and, and on and on. Now, so you have this, this broad wall, and it reminds you of Isaiah, Isaiah 22, because part of this broad wall, remains of private dwellings were found under the wall. So this is, this is apparently a kind of ancient form of eminent domain. You know what eminent domain is, right? When the government wants to come and do something, they want to build a road, they just take your stuff. Well, we'll pay you fair value for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So... But this is what happens. See, this is eminent domain. So it just it seems like a form because under here you have, you have private dwellings. 
And it reminds you of this text in Isaiah 22. It says, And you saw that the breaches of the city of David were many. You collected the waters of the lower pool, and you counted the houses of Jerusalem, and you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. And so here's the broad wall that Hezekiah constructs, and under it you find these residences. So I just think it's a neat uh, kind of confirmation of, of what's going on. Now, a seal, and it's actually a bulla, and you remember what a bulla is. The seal is the thing that makes the impression, and a bulla is you got these clay or wax blobs, but here clay, if it's surviving, where they would put it on a document or something, and they would take their seal, and it's like a signature, and impress it into the, into the clay seal or the clay blob, and then if a fire happens to it, it hardens it like pottery. So that's called a bulla, the seal. It's kind of a mirror image of the seal. And so the seal is the thing that makes the impression. The bulla just reflects the impression. So sometimes they'll call it a seal when it's really a bulla and that kind of thing. But in, in a bulla from a private collection was published in 1999 by a scholar named Frank Moorcross. And he published a bulla with an inscription that says, Belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Now by 2002, there were six known bulli plural of bulla, there were six known bulli with the same two-winged scarab image and the identical inscription belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. There is an example of one of those. Okay, so these come up by, these 1999 you first have the pu publication from a private collection, you have a number of others that surface, here is one of those. But now, in late 2015, less than a year ago, in late 2015, it was announced that a bulla that was found in 2009 excavations, not from a private collection. You see, archaeologists always would prefer to find something in the ground than to find it in a private collection because it's more sure, you see, because they, they worry about fraud. But they have ways of doing that. You know, you're going to say, well, what's one of the leading epigraphers in the world going to go and do these things? Because not every Tom, Dick, and Harry, every criminal has the ability to go imitate ancient inscriptions. Okay, so it's not like you have to say, well, we don't know where that came from. We're lost. But they're more concerned when they, when they don't find it. Well, here in the late, late 2015, this bullet that had been found in 2009, it was found by the Israeli archaeologist Eilat Mazer who's the granddaughter of a very well-known Israeli archaeologist, Benjamin Mazur. And she's been in this since she was a kid. Of course, she's got a doctorate in archaeology and all that. But she finds, this, she finds this bulla just south of the Temple Mount, and it has the very same inscription belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. So when I look at things like this and I say, here is, here is a bulla that, Ahaz, that, that Hezekiah's seal went to I think just you, you can just grab it you see and it's just, it to me it's just uh, I just find it it's, it's really neat all right now let me bring you to Jeremiah you probably know where Jeremiah is situated but I want you to see in our chart here we're coming down here Jeremiah is down here from so, say 627 to <laughs> approximately 587 because 587 is when the Babylonians uh, conquer Judah now, Jeremiah stays around for a while after that and ultimately gets taken to Egypt. So he's not, he, he doesn't end right at 587. But that'll give you an idea of roughly what we're talking about with Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 1 to 4, it says, Now Shephatiah the son of Matan, Gedaliah the son of Pasher, Jukal the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher the son of Malchiah, heard the word that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the officials, and that's those officials, said to the king, let this man be put to death. So these are the people who are lobbying for the death of the prophet Jeremiah 
Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. Say, so listen, Jeremiah is prophesying that the city is going to fall and that the way God wants you to go ahead and do it is surrender because the city's toast. He, he, he has decided after great, great patience that I will not rehearse. But he's decided that's it. And so they're saying, we got to do something. This guy needs to be put to death because in talking like that, he's weakening the resolve to fight. And so they want to have him put to death. Well, in 2005, Alak Mazer discovered in her excavations just south of the, of the Temple Mount a bulla that is inscribed with Jehuchel, son of Shelemiah. Now, Jehuchel shows up in Jeremiah 38. And you see, it's called, there it's Jukal. But in Jeremiah 37, 3, the same person, you know that because it's Jukal, son of Shelemiah, and in 37, it's Jehuchal, son of Shelemiah. Okay, so these are just alternate spellings, clearly in Jeremiah 37 and 38. So she finds a, a, a bulla that says Jehuchal, son of Shelemiah. The very person who's lobbying for the prophet Jeremiah's death, we have this. Then two years later, she uncovers near the same spot a bulla that's inscribed with Gedaliah, son of Pasher. So we have two of the people now. Elot Mazer says, it's not often that such discoveries happen in which real figures of the past shake off the dust of history and so vividly revive the stories of the Bible. And see, that's how I feel in looking at these things. You know, I, I just, I find it neat that I can look and say, I know, I know these things, I know they're historical, I know all that. But when I find an artifact that I think, this was something that was given at the direction of Hezekiah, or here are seals of these very people who were trying to have Jeremiah put to death, I just think it's neat. In the late 7th century B.C., Specifically, in 612 B.C. is when typically the shift from Assyrian power to Babylonian power is given. That is 612 is when the Babylonians conquered the Assyrian city of Nineveh. And so that's generally pegged as the time when the Babylonians replaced the Assyrians as the dominant power in the ancient Near East. In 605 and in 597, Nebuchadnezzar, he came against Judah. And he deported some of the inhabitants. 605, that's when Daniel and his buddies went. 597, that's when Ezekiel was taken. So he comes in, in 605, he comes in 597. And in 597, he, he took King Jehoiakim, who's also known as Jeconiah. He took Jehoiakim to Babylon and he put his uncle, Zedekiah, or Madaniah, Zedekiah is his throne name, but he, put, he takes Zedekiah and he puts him on the throne in his place. Now you see that in scripture in 2 Kings 24, 11 to 17, Jeremiah 24, verse 1, Jeremiah 37, verse 1. So we have here that this is what happens. Nebuchadnezzar comes at this time. He takes Jehoiakim captive to Babylon and he sticks his man on the throne. His man is Zedekiah. Well, shortly after World War II, the curator of the British Museum, who is an Assyriologist, somebody who spends his time studying about ancient Assyria, he was an Assyriologist named Donald Wiseman, and he discovered that tablets sitting in the museum, this happens more than you'd imagine, by the way, because you got these tablets, all these things, and nobody can read them. And so they just know this must be something neat, and they got them all collected in here, and sometimes somebody who actually has the ability to read them sits down and starts grunting through it. And says, you know, people don't read this stuff like you just sit down and start reading, you know, newspaper or something. you got to sit down and grind. And so every now and then somebody does that. And they find neat stuff. And that's what happened with this guy Wiseman. He discovers that these tablets that have been sitting there since the 19th century, what they're a history of events in the southern part of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, you know, this is where we have the Assyrians and the Babylonians, you know that, the Fertile Crescent. Their history of events in the southern part of Mesopotamia 
from 2350 BC down to the 6th century BC. So this is what these tablets are, and they are known as the Babylonian Chronicle. Now it's thought that this Babylonian Chronicle, that it was compiled or put together to inform the Persian kings about what the history of this region was before their conquest of the Babylonians in 539. Okay, so we have the Assyrians who are dukes for a while. The Babylonians take them beginning in 612. And then we have the, the Persians in 539 come up and displace the Babylonians as the leading war power in the ancient Near East. So the, it's thought that the Persians wanted an account of what is the history of this region that we have just conquered. And so that's what people think was going on with that. Well, the Chronicle's not complete, but some of the information, some of the gaps, that you can get that information from other sources. But the entry for the year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign that corresponds to 597 B.C., it describes Nebuchadnezzar capturing the king of Judah and installing the king of his choice. Well, that's what Scripture says, right? Nebuchadnezzar comes, he takes Jehoiakim, sticks Zedekiah, we get these external documents, and they say exactly that. That's what was happening. Now, I made myself a note here. By the way, I'm preaching tonight. If you have nowhere else to go, do come. <laughs> and also, this Wednesday, I'm starting a class. I'm going to do the Song of Songs. I've never, I've never taught the Song of Songs, but I, six months ago, I studied it a lot. And I wanted to teach it, so an opportunity arose. It's going to be upstairs, 416, but on a Wednesday night, I'm guaranteeing you there's going to be plenty of room. Okay? So if it interests you, do come. All right, that's it. In 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came against Judah. Okay, he comes in 605, Daniel. 597, Ezekiel. He comes again in 587, comes against Judah again. Now, this time he just destroys Jerusalem. This is, this is the big one. This is when he comes and takes everything out. Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 7, it refers to that final campaign. And it mentions that Lachish and Ezekiel, that they're the only fortified cities other than Jerusalem that are still holding out against Nebuchadnezzar's assault. So we have scripture, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar's assault, and third, Jeremiah 34, 7 mentions uh, Ezekiel and Lachish as the only fortified cities that are still holding out other than Jerusalem. Ezekiel is 18 miles southwest of Jerusalem, and Lachish is 11 miles south of Ezekiel. Well, in 1935 and in 1938, a British excavator by the name of J.L. Starkey, he discovered in the ruins of Lachish 21 ostraca. That's what they're called. That's broken pieces of pottery. So he discovers these 21 broken pieces of pottery. And on some of these ostraca, message, messages had been written during the time of Jeremiah, chapter 34, verse 7, when Nebuchadnezzar's army was advancing on Jerusalem for that final assault when he would destroy the city. So he finds these ostracas that have these writings on there right from that time. Now, most of the Lachish letters, most of them, they appear to be dispatches from a Jewish subordinate named Hoshiah to a commander named Yahush, who appears to be in Lachish, though there's some dispute about that. Some people think he, the commander may be somewhere else. But Hoshiah apparently was stationed at an outpost, and he was responsible for interpreting fire signals from Ezekiel and Lachish during that time. Because you can see a long way. So they had some kind of system of code or something that we can tell and communicate at a distance. And it seems his function was he was there to interpret, and he knew the signals. And so that's what he's doing. Now, Lachish Ostrakhan 4, it includes this statement here, and let my Lord know that we are waiting for the signals of Lachish according to all the indications which my Lord hath given, for we do not see Ezekiel. And see, this is as Nebuchadnezzar is, is coming. And so whether that means Ezekiel's toast, but we know what happens. We know he goes on and he winds up wiping out uh, Jerusalem. So that's another piece that ties 
uh, with Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 3. It is best translated this way. This is how it's translated in the NIV, New English Translation. It's best translated, Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and took seats in the middle gate, Nergal Sharizer of Samgar, Nebo Sarsakim, a chief officer, Nergal Sharizer, a high official, and all the other officials of the king of Babylon. See, so it's, it's best translated that Nebo Sarsakim, a chief officer of Nebuchadnezzar, that they're all present at the fall of Jerusalem. So here we have the names of specific officers of Nebuchadnezzar who are there on site at the fall of Jerusalem. Well, in 2007, a man named Michael Gersa, who's an associate professor, he was at the time at the University of Vienna, well, he's searching in the British Museum for Babylonian financial records. This is the kind of thing academics do. Uh, you think, who in the world would be going, well, he's going to go root around, he's going to see what he can find that's of interest. And he apparently has the ability to read these markings, which probably took him a long time to get. Okay, so he's down there and he's doing that. And he deciphered the cuneiform inscription on a small tablet. This tablet, it was uncovered in the 1870s. It was acquired by the British Museum in 1920. And it was a receipt dated to the 10th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which makes it 595. And it's a receipt from, uh, for a gift of gold that was made to a temple in Babylon, a temple that's located about a mile from modern Baghdad. So it's a receipt for a donation of gold that is made to this temple, and the donor identified in the receipt is Nebo Sarsakim, Nebuchadnezzar's chief eunuch. And here's the full translation of that tablet. It says, regarding 1.5 minas of gold, the property of Nabu Sharusha Ukin, now, that's a mouthful, yeah. but that is the Hebrew. You see, it is the Hebrew name that is translated to us, Nebo Sarsakim. And so it says here, Nebo Sarsakim, the chief eunuch, which he sent via Arad Banatu, the eunuch, to the temple Esangila. Arad Banatu has delivered it to Esangila in the presence of Bel Usat, son of Alpiah, the royal bodyguard, and of Nadine, son of Marduk. Zer Ibni, month 11, day 18, year 10 of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now you say, what's this about? Well, obviously you had somebody who says, listen, I want to make this donation to the temple. I'm entrusting it to you to go and deposit it. And so if you're going to do that, you better have some, some backup to say, I did it. I delivered it. So this guy wants a receipt. He don't want to have this guy saying, you didn't deliver my money. You pocketed my money. Au contraire. Read this thing. You see, so that's what that's about. But the, the thing that's important is that names Nebo Sarsakim as Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's chief eunuch and is Dr. Irving Finkel. He's a British museum expert, and I agree with this, and I liked it. He says a throwaway detail, like the names of these people, a throwaway detail in the Old Testament turns out to be accurate and true. I think that it means the whole narrative of Jeremiah takes on a new kind of power. You see these little ancillary things, just Nebo Sarsakim. You say, well, what do you know? And see the negative, now that's all, they're just making this stuff up. Some guy long ago, you know, way after the fact, was just sitting there going, well, what's a cool story? <laughs> Let me see here. What should I name the guy? Why don't we say that his chief official, well, I don't know, let's go with Nebu Sarsakim. Let's go with that. And just, you know, Shazam, we find this. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. All right. That's how, you know, you know how they go. All right. Second Kings chapter 25 and Jeremiah chapters 31 through 41, chapter 43 and chapter 52. They mention Nebuzaradan as a captain of the Babylonian guard. Now, a prism that was found, published by, was found in Babylon and it was published by a man named Eckhard Unger in 1938. It lists Nebuzaradan as a member of Nebuchadnezzar's court. Same kind of thing. Okay, here we have this person mentioned in Scripture by name. 
And what do you know? We have this external corroboration that these people making up these stories happened to land on another name of somebody who was, in fact, in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Okay. Jeremiah 36, verses 10 to 12 and verse 25, mentions a governmental official named Gamaria, son of Shaphan. Gamaria, son of Shaphan. He's associated with the temple. So we have that in Jeremiah. Now, in 1986, a man named Yigdal Shiloh, he published bullae from his excavations in Jerusalem that date to the time of Jeremiah. So here we have these, he publishes a number of these bullae from his excavations in Jerusalem from the time of Jeremiah. And one of them contains the inscription, Gamaria, son of Shaphan. So there we have, we have that. Now, this is very likely the same person. It's easier when you have somebody like, you know, uh, king, of, king of Judah. No question. So when you have this, somebody's going to say, well, is that, is that the right guy? Is that the same guy as in the Bible? Well, almost certainly it's the same guy because of the combination of names, the fact that Shaphan was a relatively rare name, the fact it was found near locations uh, mentioned in the biblical narrative, and there's other indications that the seal owner was likely a government, a government official. So, yes, this is in fact Gamaria. This is Gamaria, son of Shaphan, that's mentioned in Scripture. And we wind up here in Jerusalem finding his seal, and isn't that amazing? First Chronicles chapter 6, verse 13, chapter 9, verse 11, Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. They reveal that the high priest, Hilkiah, now Hilkiah is mentioned in 2 Kings 22, uh, second, in, in 2 Kings 22, verses 4 through 14, mentioned repeatedly, 2 Kings 23, verse 4, Hilkiah is mentioned, but in 1 Chronicles 6, 13, boy, that went fast, 1 Chronicles 9, 11, and Ezra 7, 1, it reveals that this high priest, Hilkiah, had a son named Azariah. Well, Yigdal Shiloh uncovered in his excavations in Jerusalem a seal bearing the inscription, Azariah, son of Hilkiah. And so here we have another person who's identified. Now, perhaps most famously, and maybe uh, most thrillingly, I don't know, but Baruch, the son of Neriah, he's the person in Jeremiah chapter 36 who wrote on a scroll the words that Jeremiah dictated. He's writing here. He's Jeremiah's scribe. Baruch, son of Neriah. He's also mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 32, chapter 43, chapter 45. And in the mid-1970s, there was a horde of over 250 bullae that surfaced in the antiquities market in Jerusalem. Now, it's thought that these bullae were uncovered by unauthorized diggers from a house in Jerusalem that had been burned during the Babylonian assault in 587. So it had been destroyed. Well, in 1978, archaeologist Naman Avigad, he published what are known as the Burnt House Bulli. And he publishes those, and one of them's bearing the inscription... Berechayahu, son of Nerayahu, the scribe. Now that's quite interesting. See, this is Baruch. I'm sorry, this is Baruch, son of Neriah, the scribe. You say, well, what's up with the other endings? Well, the ending Yahu that you see on both of the names, that was a, that was a shortened form of Yahweh. So apparently that's their full name, is that you've got this. It's Berechayahu and Nerayahu. But their name is given in Scripture as a shortened form of those full names. So it's simply Baruch and Neriah. That's here. Now, there are some people who still, these are widely accepted as authentic. Okay, this, this, these inscription, this inscription on this bulla is widely accepted as authentic. But you have some people who want to carp about it. It seems very doubtful to me. That even if you had somebody who had the capability of doing this and being able to fool all these experts, that if you're going to try to do that, that you would give this full name that adds Yahoo to it if you were trying to pass it off as something. If you're going to do a forgery, it seems to me that you're unlikely to vary from how it's given in Scripture. 
But see, that's, that's part of it. That's the full name. And so I, uh, but as I say, most people recognize that that's a, a, a very weak kind of thing uh, claim to make. But I just think, here, so, you know, how cool is that? I don't know if you can't read the little thing under there, but it says, a bulla of Baruch ben Neriah, the fingerprint not noticeable in the photograph is located in the highlighted area. So this has a fingerprint up here. And I'm just thinking, okay, so is that the, is that the fingerprint there? Is that, uh, is that Baruch's fingerprint? And I just think it's neat. You know, is that, is that it right there? He was there back long ago, right when these things, Jeremiah, he's writing. Everybody, ah, you know, you believe in that old book. I say, yeah, I believe in that book. You've got that right. <laughs> you know, and that book's from God. And I get to see these things. All right, Jeremiah 36, 26. Mentions Jeremiah, the son of, son of the king, as one of the officials who were sent by King Jehoiakim to arrest Jeremiah and Baruch. Now it's not certain whether the, whether the title son of the king, is that literal? Does that mean he's literally the son of the king or is that the title of an office? Like you've got, you know, son of the king is, is a particular assistant or administrator in that position. Not sure about that. But one of the burnt house bulli that was published by Avagad is Jer Jeremiel, son of the king. So here's one of the, here's one of the people sent to arrest Jeremiah and Baruch, their seal turns up. You say, how are they getting all these seals? Because these people were concentrated in Jerusalem. They're doing business there. That's where all of these this sealings going on. And you come burn the place. Well, what happens? I get all these bulla. Bulla, all of them. Okay, well, why? That, that's why. How many documents are they pumping out? Yeah, you go, okay, I'm in, yeah. So they're over here and you burn them and they get hard and they shouldn't get in the ground. So that's why you're seeing so many seals here. Jeremiah 36, 12 mentions Elishama, the secretary of one of the king's officials. Second bell, yes? yes. It's been real. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah.